Bom dia, pessoal. Bom dia a todos aí nos assistindo hoje, quinta-feira. Good morning, everyone. Everyone who's watching us. I'm Adriano Pedrosa. I'm art, artistic director of the Maspi Museum. This is our second seminar dedicated to the histories of diversity. Diversity is very important to us. It's part of our mission statement. In the first sentence, in fact, and this has driven our programs on all these different topics in that since 2016. So in the first sentence of our mission statement, this sentence defines the Museum of Art of São Paulo as a diverse, inclusive and pluralistic museum. So diversity for us has a lot to do with gender diversity, queer diversity. And these are the topics we'll be focusing on in this project around the histories of diversity. So this is our second seminar. The first was held last year. And this anticipates a whole year that will be dedicated to this uh, issue, 2024. Since 2016, 17, the Maspi Museum has directed its programs on these, uh, on different histories, like, for instance, histories of childhood. But we just, we had a few conferences, events, and uh, shows in 2016. Now in 2017, we had a whole year dedicated to the histories of sexuality. In 2018, it was about the uh, rainforest. And then 2019, women and feminist issues. In 2020, the year of the pandemic, we were closed for about seven years. So, uh, and, and anyway, this year was dedicated to dance in 2021, 22, we are still uh, working on Brazilian histories in 2023. We will have indigenous histories in 2024, diversity histories in 2025, histories of ecology in 2026, histories of delirium and madness. This is a very important seminar. We'll have another one next year. So we will be holding three seminars that will anticipate the discussions that will take place in this topic. And it will also nourish this anthology of texts that we publish every year to uh, go together with our schedule with our activities. The histories of diversity are also like a series that have unfolded since 2017 with the histories of sexuality and in 2019, histories of women and feminist histories. And now we are here on the way to 2024 to discuss histories of diversity. The notion of histories in the plural is very important to us. Unlike mainstream history teaching with a single version of history, supposedly the only true version, we want different histories that are inclusive and pluralistic. These are uh, histories of polyphony, histories of processes, histories with a speculative dimension, including political stories, personal stories, economic, cultural histories, among many others. Even, uh, you know, history of art is something that uh, in mainstream uh, speeches uh, was not, or, or now we will say histories of art. They're also uh, also in the plural, and they are just one layer of all these 
histories we're trying to encompass. So today we have our second seminar and I'd like to thank all participants who are have joined us today and tomorrow. It's a two-day seminar. I'd also like to thank the organizers who have been uh, working hard to make this seminar happen. And these are Andre Mesquita, a curator, and who leads our Department of Mediation and Public Programs. And then Davi Ribeiro, who's also assistant curator in our public uh, programs. And Julia Prime Wilson, who's our art and contemporary art curator. And Guilherme Jufrida, who's our assistant curator and who will mediate the first uh, panel. So Guilherme Jufrida, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you everyone for coming. Guilherme, over to you. Thank you, Adriano. Thank you for introducing our conference. Hello everyone who's uh, watching this conference. I'm Guilherme Jufrida. I'm assistant curator in this museum and I'll be the mediator of this first session. In all sessions, as we usually do in these online seminars, uh, questions by the audience should be sent to the chat of the YouTube channel and my team and I will select them and try to address them all at the end of every session in the Q&A session. Every speaker will have 20 minutes and we're uh, kindly requesting our speakers to uh, respect this time and then we will have a Q&A session in the afternoon we will have another session and tomorrow we will have another uh, two sessions. This morning We'll have three present we will have three presentations and i'll start by introducing each of the speakers and then i'll ask them to speak so first the big gale campus leal like a sinuous mountain system moves between art and philosophy as a means to produce poetics that materially affects the undoing of the colonial world, generating radically different ways of dancing life in the cosmos. She's the organizer of Slam Marginalia, a poetry battle made by and for trans people. She has published Discourse Poetic Ontographies, The Sex of Word 2020, and Exorbitances, paths to desert gender published by Glack in 2021 she is a doctoral student in philosophy at the catholic university of sao paulo and her research is on transition escapism ra racialized transpoetics and the end of ontology she also teaches in the civilization course uh, in the human sciences and the colonial thought department of the, the catholic university of sao paulo a big girl you have the floor good morning everyone Thank you, Guilherme, for introducing me. I'd also like to thank Anna. I think that she was the person who invited me, and she's one of the first people I got in touch with the uh, Maspi Museum, and Adriano, too, in the uh, Mass Museum that invited me. I'd also like to thank all the other members of the panel, Guilherme, and everyone else who's watching us. Before I start, I'd like to mention some uh, of the books I published, Curisendo, published in 2020, and then Exorbitances. So if you want to learn more about my books and buy them, get in touch. And I'll uh, show you my social media where I advertise my work, my Instagram page. That's uh, at B, B, B Dosa, if you want to see my work there. And if you want also to make stories, that is great. It will help us uh, really expand my footprint beyond my circles. In addition, 
we're discussing diversity in the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo, the MASP. And unfortunately, we had a recent uh, development in the art show Brazilian Histories. And I acknowledge that Sandra Benitez and Clarice Dinizio, who suffered, there was, let's say, a uh, well, an episode with the photos of the MST or Landless Movement photos in the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo Masp is getting in touch with the curators. They're trying to address the problem. And this is very important. And also what Masp has been doing to really approach diversity in the sense of Edouard Glissant, uh, that diversity of cares and the world and not new liberal uh, diversity. So this move by MASP, uh, getting closer to this uh, type of diversity and having it in the museum, and this applies to all institutions. It means that all these issues and all institutions need to restructure themselves to welcome diversity, the structure of institutions, the way it is, it uh, repeals or, or, or sends away uh, diversity. So the idea is to add all these elements that are usually separate from these structures. And these stories and this flesh of these people should be welcomed so that they can remain in these institutions. Okay. My uh, talk is called Planetary Dysphoria. It's a provisional text. It's a speculative fiction text, which is uh, a product of other texts. It starts with fire and, and a flame. And I also has to do with opening my uh, mouth and showing the tongue and many other very interesting texts. So you might get lost in the story, but I think it's worth uh, doing and, and, and getting lost is part of life. So planetary dysphoria, the spiral tail, everything so weird. The world is a song where all sounds are slightly dissonant and are slightly out of pace. And every instrument is being played in a different rhythm. But in some way, everything seems to be in harmony and in sync. This is the world. Everything is sort of bluish, purplish, grayish. I only see the arch of the world, that uh, purple ball full of holes that is getting grayer as we get closer to the edge, getting almost white, interspersed with black patches that become craters. In the background, the infinite obscurity with small light points of scintillating yellow emerge from darkness, luminous and fragile, as though they were about to uh, to disappear. And these small uh, dying light points in some uh, bluish, purplish patches are like a mixture of luminous points with some sort of gas. They seem to move. Everything seems to be full of life and in fullness. And this is where the weird song seems to come from, from this land full of holes, the obscurity of this infinite and the points of light of gaseous smoke with this sublime, weird music. Everything is strangely complete. There's no one else here, not even me, but in a way I am here and I'm not alone. The land is full of holes, the obscure infinity, the light points, the gaseous smoke. Each of these elements is an entity full of life, or each of these entities is maybe a whole crowd of its a world on its own. Nothing of this can be seen, but I feel its vibrations in my deepest hollow. That's not all. 
all over the place in this land full of holes before me on the edges in the background i feel lies if this nothing this infinite was peopled inhabited they're not people but mysterious presences i can feel these energies a little um, luminous a little gaseous as though they had a mysterious intention a life that unfolds on its own as this had a mysterious intention a life that unfolds on its own as though they had a trajectory with their own laws in their own wandering owners of their destiny this is a strange pulse and this movement is like breathing i'm also one of those weird presences and that means that in a way i'm nothing it as well this silence weird science is a memory a weird presence that is nothing i don't know if i'm huge or if everything else has shrunk i seem to be on top of this ball full of holes so that if i stand up i can go beyond the dark gaseous atmosphere and get close to the border with a few steps so i get up and i run and run and run i take more steps than i imagined and then i leap toward this infinite darkness but then this might not be the sphere full of holes that is small but rather it may be huge with millions of kilometers and i'm even greater larger gigantic with millions and millions of kilometers so in this darkness i will fly but parts of me are lost as i move ahead so remember that i didn't run but that i swam and in a way i feel as though i had legs and this may be a memory of some life that i had before or maybe a prophecy of a new transmutation i don't know what legs are i think that in a way this has also to do with this weird feeling that i get when i feel this perfect fullness of the obscure infinite i don't know what that means but i feel that i should say that there's no more uh sun here i don't remember the sun but i but i feel that the sun should be here and that it should be weird to be here without the sun the sun should be like this ground full of holes that has supported me have i left the sun behind as i left that purple ball behind or maybe in these gaseous smokes or the, maybe the infinite is the sun music is still there i look back to a part with that smoke and in this sublime uh, instant i feel that i have a gaseous tail this might be a memory and i think that in some life i had legs sacrificing my carcass good afternoon you better you moved a lot and you said things that no one could understand you've been sleeping for about two days oh sorry i'm obsidian what where am i who are you what is this place no i asked the questions here who are you and what are you doing here but then first well sorry i'm sorry sorry to interrupt i'm okay i think i could say i'm better because i don't remember how i was before yeah really you you look better this you can you you suspect from afar i'm called carcass or at least this was my name i don't know i think i'm opening a new transition i live since 47 in the national youth institution of Nivukatiti in the federal district some group of friends escaped i don't know where they were they said they were going to the Araras Quilombo. five days later they didn't return we had no idea of uh, their whereabouts so we decided to believe that the Quilombo de Araras is real and that they had really managed to get there that's what i believe in this is why i was the one to escape i hitchhiked and 
went with a trucker to the state of Santa Catarina. And this seems to be the Serra das Araras place. And I followed some uh, coordinates of my system. And then I felt the sounds of uh, drones in that national road. And I got paranoid. I thought this was an ambush. I felt that this was a sound bomb and I couldn't remember anything else. This is unbelievable as far as I know. You got here in the Nascimento tunnel, tunnel, and that means that you were 20 kilometers away at about 150 from the Quilombo das Araras. And this is really true. And I think that you were found next to the tunnel, bloody with uh, break broken parts in your uh, right leg in coma and someone might have helped you in the uh, mountain range taking you uh, 50 kilometers into the tunnel and then defended you there in another confrontation with the cruisers and maybe with the uh, slaughterers and yes you were going through a transition what do you mean what's that no I, I don't mean about your prior processes, but your uh, wounds were very severe. We had to amputate your right leg, and also we added a copper mechanical prosthetics. Also, we had to add a layer of dermatine that is synthetic in your abdomen carcass, then gets up from the bed and the sheet falls down, she looks down and she sees the metal plate kind of soft on the left part of uh, his uh, belly and going up the cage ribs close to the armpits and she raises the sheets even more and sees her right leg full of copper. No, not copper, Tim, her right toe moves up and down and these subtle movements are there and all of a sudden her le right leg raises and knocks off the bed and brings down the mattress and carcass almost falls to the side with her right leg she holds to the bed and she coughs strongly and before bringing the left hand to her mouth uh, blood comes out of her mouth and falls on her leg and a slight creak of blood drips from her chin, chin dripping and her, her hospital gown take it easy you need to get used to your movement control but this is good this is very good we have done a great job and then you have to thank amon our clinical uh, helper who took care of your surgery. Usually people take three to five days to control movements and you have done it just in a few minutes. That means we have made a great a job and also that you have an amazing mental control and metabolism. So does that mean, yes, you are no longer a human. Welcome to the club, says Obsidian, smiling and turning her head to the side. With her left hand, she picks up a, lock from her hair and exposes her ear and then you can see in a semi translucent plastic something that is between silicon and acrylic and you can see the circuits and the chips and that's a mechanical ear and she says did you like it i survived to cru cruisers that uh, placed a bomb, sonic bombs, while I was hiding in the National Highway Guard and a gas station. I totally lost my hearing. I had everything and all, all the system and my auditory uh, system, but everything melted. I always dreamed of uh, not being human anymore, but I didn't know it would be that difficult. It seems like a curse. You will get used to it. In fact, it's not going to be easy but actually it has never been because we have never been human this white shit has never given us anything we have always been at the margin at the sewage or at the humankind coffin so it's not going to be any harder or violent uh, than what you're already used to but it's going to be much more beautiful in power than you have or have ever imagined i left this is our forest, said Karkara, 
pointing to bushes, grasses, and trees that seem to come out of a dense part of the, the woods. Uh, for me, everything is woods that are cast following the small steps from Karkara with no help of the cane. For you from the city, everything seems to be bushes, but you were right, we plant our food side by side to non-eatable plants of bushes and even trees and the shadows help not to burn the smaller trees and usually they also exchange nutrients one feeds from minerals from the others that do not use or also waste can become food for others also it helps to get away with the aphids and grasshoppers baba Nu was the first one to uh, come through this path and he has learned from the elderly before this white sheet of permaculture. Baba used to say that this was how it went when our ancestors planted centuries ago. And then we found that the ones that came from this land also planted like this. And you have a lot to learn from here. The life in the reform school really did a lot of harms. We have a lot ahead of us. Yes, we need to get ready because we are going together very soon. Everything was agitated. Arizada used to play and run, uh, screaming all over. And the elderly were taking the corn cobs and baskets. And it was almost night. The sun was setting as small group, Pesadelo, Fefa, and Chacao, were testing the Bluetooth microphone in a sound system, turning on the gas generators. Another group was testing the projections, showing images of, I oh, will see you on the other side, a documentary on the uh, uh, revolution of 33 that has overthrown the first demolition coup. I had never been in a forest before. Everything's so calm here. Sometimes I almost forget everything I lived. I, I think about my friends in Noemi, Kau, Jira, Cordillera. How are they doing? Are they doing okay? Are they still alive? Carcass speaks slowly while looking at the projections and there are images of uh, fire and rebellion and also looks at the crimson sky of the wildfires with few stars. Arizada would get the wooden bills full of a bubble and would go to the center of the fireplace and would sit in the tatamis or a rubber mats right by the sound system. Everyone little by little would sit down and a, an initial bearing bowl play starts spaced out slow, mysterious, followed by the sound of drums and rattles. Little by little, the laughs of Arizada disappears and the elderly would bring down their heads and close their eyes. Some youth would lay down on the mats and others on the grass. Daome and Ginga were the only ones making noise, giggling, but no one would matter about those little brats. It's just like their sounds were part of the ritual as well. Between the berimbau playing, Baba Anu would vocalize a few sounds, would repeat vowels in mysterious soft ages, and sometimes would sing words in ancient Yoruba, and then silence. Good evening, good evening. It is once again a great pleasure and joy to be here with you, ancestors that have the gift of sharing this life. And I hope I am the last one on this planet, says Baba Nu in a solemn tone, but getting a lot of laughs. Today we have a special night because we are celebrating one month that Carcass is here with us and the Black Dream Village. And also we are celebrating Bayeka comeback. Uh, it's how is it to have one month again, once again, uh, a lot of laughs, a cool. And this time a round of applause also is brought by Baba Karkas, then uh, kind of embarrassed, closes the fists and turn them to the side while looking at it and imitating a baby crying. We have a lot to learn with the the strength and of your metabolic activity, right, Aman? But today we need to be calm because we are facing difficult times ahead. Our 
informational intelligence team has found a message between the militia of the federal district and a station of the federal highway police and it looks like the militia forces are going to the south and the state of nova santa catarina is going to become a headquarters of the militia force and the government and the reform school is going to be de deactivated and indians and blacks and uh, those that are uh, gender and sexual disorders will be deported and probably murdered does that mean that yes we and all the uh, villages and the Colombo Guadamara down are at a risk, but we believe that we might be saved because we do have our anti drone system. We can try to go to closer to the highway to escape. It's not possible. This is another extermination tactics, and you only think about hiding yourselves. That's enough. We, you can't hide ourselves anymore, screams Caracas you have no idea what we and our ancestors have done to ensure this place our life and we are not going to risk that for nothing our life our land our joy that we have here in this black dream is more important than all this white shit. and we are not going to risk that because of urban egos that are worried about building a combative image then and guaranteeing the life of our species. I've seen a lot in this life, says Baba Anu, crying, but I only hope, I only hope that you live as long as I am. I did not mean to offend your ancestors, and I apologize, Karkara, and I apologize with all the respect, but I'm tired to, to feel that you think that I don't know anything because I grew in the shit of the district and I spent part of my life in a reform school. You treat me as if I am uh, no one in the city. You, I really don't know how to plant. You don't know how many times I've been raped by guards there, how many friends I lost because of beatings and failed escapes or suicide. You don't know what tricks I had to use to get food or hormones or how I learned to lose crusaders and slaughterers and how to support how to stand all this pain that made me strong while I was here and I was being cared by you and I will be uh, grateful for that forever. I was dreaming that was a kind of a planet in an infinite with no sun. I felt my communion force with something greater than consciousness or I. It was not a dream, but now I realize it was a cosmic memory. When I woke up, I was already the, the flesh with the uh, earth with team with mineral life and therefore i now i have the courage a courage that no human will have and i want to be faithful to the obscure magma that is inside me i don't want only to defend myself but and with humankind i'm going to attack fuck the museums that illegally fund our sound but contribute to our effacing the facing of our stories where are these allies with the trucks and the tanks I am tired of negotiating and hacking. I was reborn to death and courage for me is a path for my eternal life. And this is a courage act. I also do that to defend Sonia Negro, the black dream and all of you. This is gratitude and that's for you, uh, old Baba, that I want to leave and to go to the mortal confrontation against all humankind. I was reborn and I want you to reborn with me. but. Only the war against this world will make life come out again. And you can call me Osiris. Or Osiris then gets up, look to the, looks to the sides, looking at the a, a sign of an alliance, but nothing. No one moves, not a word. Then she turns and starts walking towards the dormitory. Wait, I'm coming screams pesadelo me too and now fefa and then Marichuel and tourmalina who also run to be with osiris thank you thank you very much abigail for your wonderful presentation once again i would like to invite the audience to send your comments 
and your questions we will we'll ask them at the end i also would like to mention about the brazilian uh, stories and i would like to inform you the uh, retomadas nuclear was back we have the curatorship of sandra and clarice there and we we have then the um, they are exhibit reopened in august so i would like to bring you all this information and now i would like to turn the floor to our next speaker bruno oliveira bruno is an educator and visual artist he is a doctoral student in visual arts at the federal university of minas gerais and holds a master's degree in latin american interdisciplinary studies in parana he is also a specialist in visual arts and contemporaneity by iwi MG and holds a bachelor's degree in computer science by Fumaki, also Minas Gerais. He is a researcher for the Malacca Group, which conducts multidisciplinary studies in urban design and architecture in the south at the UNILA. He has worked as a program coordinator at Cazon in Sao Paulo, a cultural center welcoming LGBT youth expelled from their homes. Currently, he is an educator and artist at a Jamaica a Visual Arts Citizenship Studio in Sao Paulo and belongs to the Bajoba Collection Group, an initiative for preservation, safeguarding, and historiographical research on Brazilian LGBT art memory and culture. The floor is yours, Bruno. Hello, everyone. I will open my presentation. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen because I have some slides to show you everything is working i hope so very well Fui. can you see my screen yes i can see i can see your presentation yes it's pink yes that's right very well I would like to start by thanking you for this invitation and thank you, Abigail, for your presentation. Yes, I am here among this mist of your presentation and I thank you very much for your uh, patience and for being assistant in the context that these have been very complex years. Also, Thanks to the interpreters. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Guilherme, for the invitation. Thank you, Adriano and the MASP team. I am very happy to, to know just what Guilherme told us. And I also, um, Sandra and Clarice, thank you for this process. And congratulations on the social movements. Congratulations to MST in all the forms to, to avenge life. Now to prepare our presentation, when I was preparing this presentation today, I, I was trying to think how would it be possible to bring together a number of things. So this is going to be a kind of an out loud reflection and I hope that I can convey my message within my 20 minutes. And I, I hope that I do not get carried away. And I say that because these experiences that I'm going to briefly bring to you, they come from a period when I was working at Casa Un, and they are really practical experience. They are related to that place specifically and uh, from uh, everything that we had there. Casa Un is an, a place to welcome LGBT people, and it was founded in 2017, and it is operated, and it is uh, uh, many people work there. A, a lot of people have been there already. And maybe, you know, just as an introduction to start talking about these experiences, maybe we can, can uh, discuss the words that we are going to be using here. Because to understand these words in this context, maybe we have to be talking about them while we are pushing the piano, we, while we are going to the police station, or while we uh, look for something, uh, you know, for some um, 
a, a drum that is similar to a Chavez scenario for something that we need to use. Now, now going back to what Adriano said, you know, was something that is important is the sentences. These are powerful words and that's a start that's important to start there's history art diversity inclusion all of these are sentence words and they have to do with the power dimension and i wonder like when uh adriano mentioned the tools that were used by uh the slave masters uh, that we might be part of this field but we need to understand the limits of this game and what can be done or what they can do. I'm saying this because when we are living creative processes of this culture, this chaos that the world is, that Abigail also brought up the idea of a chaos world or a world chaos and one of diversity and also uh, something that has to do with promoting autonomy and freedom because these are subjected or made subservient and there's also speculation that keeps these uh, ties or the dynamics of this game i also discussed the material conditions for these words to be disputed in these conditions might lead to true equality of forces in this field in this game i'm not talking about space matter food time wishes desire and even uh, directions that are in, inherent to this game, time, the, the talks, the speed of the talks, there's a whole set of directions that are inherent to this game and that will restrict these possibilities and accesses. So our task is probably one or the idea behind this talk is probably an attempt to use another language, an attempt to translate what this is, then what it means to wash a bathroom or look for this uh, barrel. So this knowledge in this experience, uh, they are part of a practice which belongs to the ground, in fact, a specific ground I might use words and categories that may be familiar and may coincide with some language registers that are, uh, for instance, in the advertising material for this seminar, and that I might even uh, use, but they also talk about other things. They may refer to other experiences and world practices so even though i may use them of these words they have meanings that are even uh hidden to me i might repeat these words but they also exist under other conditions in other ways of living in other worlds so with this introduction which is also a false uh, talk i wondered that i could maybe talk about a text by Jay that was, or Jota, that was published, a whole uh, series of texts that were published by the Mass Museum about speculative economy and the presence or uh, experience about these conditions of this specific game, and also the commoditization of these perspectives of diversity and inclusion. We must recognize that this political and symbolic arsenal that manipulates my presence in this place, these lead to the conditions under which we speak and how what we say will be understood. So there's a lot of authorization, there's authorization, but also welcoming. 
and this has to do with a space that is restricted to other people that might or not watch this, might be watching this, but also leading to the possibility or impossibility of presence. Like when Guilherme mentioned the CV or the resume in the presence of non-curricular elements, I needed to say all of this in my first seven minutes. I'm just checking the stopwatch here as I was told to be restricted to the limits. I just wanted to get to the beginning of this uh, proposal in the title that was given a while before. And this is about experiences that were not done for love. They were created from a life that goes beyond this dimension of images and of titles and summaries and abstracts and it operates in this presence and in this sharing of something else of a different negotiation process so in the, in the world of words or in the presence of these bodies in, in these practices and in these works there's also something that i believe is important and this is an element of performance, of institutional performance. In many other moments, these presences or this the performance of these by these institutions that we see in these art shows and all these talks and many other uh, speeches and discourses, this uh, presence in these institutions, these institutional performances sometimes uh, not negotiable because we don't do it for love. This should be reminded, I think. So the four experiences I'll be presenting really briefly uh, have to do with the practices in these spaces. This is a warehouse that has been in the Bexiga district of Sao Paulo. It's been there for five years. And the ground on which they were built it has to do with a practice of art and memory that's highly complex and continuing and uh, they're alive, they are contradictory, they're moving in there, sometimes irrecognizable because they are not based on the premise of monuments or uh, pedestals. In this, may we may have a name and a year and restrict these experiences to a slide because I'm far from this space and this uh, device, which is artistic or educational, it was installed. But I'm talking about a ground of dialogic and performance practices because in our daily lives, in the lives where they existed, they were not different from opening the doors uh, watering the plants or from cleaning bathrooms of psychological counseling of uh, crochet lessons of uh, readings in the square or even choreography at the entrance of our space and because of these institutional performances and that belongs to a symbolic network that is socially recognized that's why this invitation was made because it fits into some criteria that are built for this virtual scenario. And I could talk about this scenario, sorry, this performance with a functional component of material maintenance, creating material conditions of presence, both individual and collective. And also this element of the imagination, but this does not fit the idea of a spectacle or a show, this institutional performance quality is does not fit this format or this presence of this slide. It's not part of this vocabulary, but because there are other devices, these words, they are already built and they have settled in a set of uh, multi-structure forms, the platform, the ground of the museum, and our speech. So in order to understand the performance quality of these practices, 
to make them speak. This is about promoting autonomy for this other notion of what art can be and what citizenship can be, and also a material construction of these practices. It requires time, other images, other labor relations as well, which could be represented here or discussed. And also, uh, you need lots of people that are not here. Many things that we don't have time to in these 20 minutes. Now, eight minutes that I have left. Now, I'd like to talk about four very brief experiences. I'm really interested. I want to repeat them. I want to make them resonate. And they're very important for what I'm trying to communicate. And it starts with this theater play that was performed. And again, theater play, it might take maybe two, three years preparing and being present like a fruit salad that was being uh, chopped up in the afternoon. It's called LGBT and it was articulated or created by a group of people, Carolina Marcelo, João Caio, Andre, Fabio Isaias, Karine, Mariana, Pedro, Sabrina, Yolanda. And uh, these names should be uh, spoken. I'm just, this is the message to the translators. And this was developed by this group of children and people that were there based on their daily life, being there, coming to that space. So there was this daily presence of these people. When I talk about this key uh, panel, again, it has to do with this experience. And in this space and in this talk, in this PDF file that is presented in a seminar on the histories of diversity, it doesn't, it's not enough, of course, uh, to fit the, 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 this presence cannot be held in this structure. One more thing that was part of that experience is something that was really important for us. And this was called the Temporary Institute for Research on Censorship. This was a group of people that were there on this ground present who investigated censorship that reflected upon the notion of censorship. What can censorship be for our people? What can freedom mean? What can be a lover, a person that loves in this structure of censorship, historic censorship that was also part of this process of listening and also of welcoming and also of institutional performance. This is something I insist on. We always, or we used to develop a series of instruments in this institution to try to talk or establish links between all these quadrants within all this vocabulary, like with uh, Abigail Campos Leal, who's was generous enough and participated in some of these actions with us. And we'll be resuming this point some uh, later. Then there's another initiative, which was I really like to stress. And this is a podcast. And that was a very interesting format. So it starts from a conversation with a group of people, Caroli Florence, Adriana Mara, Adriana Penteado, João Pais, who thought on how we could discuss this history and an LGBT memory in a different way. Negotiating with the idea of a, a show or spectacle and also drifting away from violence as a spectacle and also what speculation could be done. We're always trying to defend the idea that a boring uh, queer can exist. 
no. There was another initiative that we also uh, worked, conducted, and that was very important. And, and that was an idea of creating this publisher that could open room for other writings for, for production and uh, circulation of these writings. And I like to stress four experiences. One of them was Scrivivencias or living writings. And this is uh, an attempt to find possible formats for these people to express themselves. And this was mediated by Daniel Vega, this uh, workshop called Escrevivencias, then production of posters by Vanessa Suarez and Abigail, starting from one particular workshop. And then there was a publication that was launched this year, and this is called Poetics of Life, Poeticas de Vida. in this with a partnership with the GIV and again very similar to the Escrevivencias workshop and a final uh, experience that was also very important very significant and this is our memory album media, mediated by Caio Jardi and also with support from Laura and João Paulo and it has to do with uh, memory and autobiographies. So this was a proposal that was very important to us. So it, we found a way of being in other spaces. Finally, I'd like to ask you, I have 18 minutes and 45 seconds, uh, so I'd like to quote a group, a fragment of a text by Abigail that she wrote for the Temporal Institute for Research on Censorship, and it's again free and for download. It is called a trans uh, racialized carcass. And it was an invitation. Abigail was invited to talk about a set of images of the public archive of the state of Sao Paulo. These images were in a art show the, on trans people and uh, transvestites that were being documented, that were documented in the repression system. I'll read this fragment and I think it will open to uh, more possibilities. But this is a very important thing. This is all archived, not only in the public archive of the state of Sao Paulo, but in every corner of the city. In the pigeons, the dirt of pigeons, in the uh, underground galleries with uh, cockroaches and rats, in every district in this city, in every corner, the marks of this anti trans violence echo everywhere present in the architecture and geography of this great graveyard, which is also a locomotive that is out of the tracks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno, for your talk. And now I'd like to invite our last speaker. We're really honored by your presence, Monica Benicio, who is a human rights and LGBTI plus activist, born and raised in the favela de Marais slum in Rio de Janeiro. She's holds an architecture and urban design degree from the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and also a master's degree in architecture in the era of violence and the right to the city. She's a counselor for the city of Rio de Janeiro and has worked to promote and defend women's rights and social inclusion and urban design practices. Since the murder of her partner, Councilwoman Marielle Frank on March 14, 2016, she has been tirelessly devoted to the fight for justice around this barbaric crime and became an international reference in the defense of human rights. So now, Monica, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Guilherme. First, I would like to 
congratulate MASP on this program dedicated to uh, diversity and queer stories. And also, Guilherme, once again, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be part of this uh, history. And I also would like to greet Abigail and Bruno, our, my panel colleagues here. And good morning, everyone. Well, Guilherme introduced me, and I will uh, mention Bruno. Because in, in the beginning, he said that he was going to uh, think out loud. It was going to be a reflection. So uh, I would like to say that I will bring to you a life report. And, and that's not far from our topic, because I usually say that the body is the most powerful political tool that we have. And I was invited here to talk about the power of lesbian women and the consolidation of Brazilian democracy. And I'm happy already with the title of this presentation. I'd like to start by saying how important it is for me, a young lesbian woman uh, born and raised in one of the largest favelas in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I did not have lesbian women as references. And, and here we are talking about the late, late 80s and 90s where I was discovering my sexuality and I did not have any reference and it was very difficult. And just like uh, Guilherme said, I am a moderator in Rio, but a lot of my trajectory happens uh, because of the, 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 the greatest, the hugest disgrace that happened in my life. And uh, this, uh, we do face uh, uh, lots of challenges. So. I will bring to you some violent data, unfortunately, but it's important to understand the representativeness importance in such a panel. I am very honored about this invitation. I think we have to understand the society's structure, bringing in the landmarks of the patriarchal um, culture and and that is going to reflect on women's uh, frailty. I think we lost her. She said that there was a problem with her connection. So probably she had internet problems uh, or some type of connection problems. So let's check. Um, I will see if we have um, anything on her. I hope that she's able to come back. Just uh, hold on, please. Olá, pessoal. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. So we were able to reconnect with Monica. Fortunately, I'm going to ask her to resume her presentation. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you once again, Guilherme. I apologize. Uh, it has been 
uh, an unstable internet morning. Guilherme, uh, please uh, let me know how much time I have. I think you have 18 minutes. We're just starting to hear your presentation. Very well. So if we are, we lesbian women have been saying, especially the feminist ones, if we are saying that visibility matters, that visibility ensure rights and visibility protects, we are going to develop a narrative here to understand the invisibility of lesbian women. I like to say that love beach among women is a revolutionary act and the uh, patriarch the patriarch uh, uh, really becomes nervous with that and so in in this century um, it's not recognized the existence of lesbian women and this is clear for us because we see the lack of official data and tools that allow us to count our bodies and to see what kind of public policy we could have for us. Because once we don't have data, you know, this is very relevant for invisibility and that generates more violence and more uh, vulnerability for us. And it's not by chance that we advocate for visibility. So we are in 2022 claiming the right um, to life. And this is still increased in a process where the uh, a, a patriarch is maintained. And if we cut out the gender, the class, race, you see that the black lesbian women are the ones that are most vulnerable. We had a recent victory recently. The IBG, the Brazilian Statistics Institute, uh, published recently about um, the sexual orientation of the Brazilian population. But this was announced by the Federal Prosecutor's Office, and they questioned that the 2022 census did not include questions on the LGBTQ plus population. Also taking into consideration the strong pressure of the LGBTQ plus pressure and the organized society, and these are crucial so that we can have policies for us LGBT and to move forward on the more democratic agenda because we are in times where a bolsonarism um, advancement is really a violation to democracy. Lesbian invisibility can be represented in many ways. When we talk about campaigns to prevent um, sexually transmitted diseases, and they are always concentrated in the phallocentric sex, we talk about in vitro fertilization. I am sorry, she was muted. Hello, Monica. You muted. Okay, I'm back. So I will bring you some data. Invisibility we have here in the data, the very significant violence data here. It was a study developed that showed that 126 women were killed from 2014 to 17 just because they are lesbians. In 2017, 37% of death happened in the Southeast region, and that violence is brutal. 55% of deaths in 2017 were by firearms and 23 by stabbing. And we need to bring to the debate the fact that the violence against the LGBT population is so cruel that that also can be reflected in the murder. The LGBT population is murdered with cruelty, as we can also see in the case in Sao Paulo, where a travestite was murdered and and, and in a place of her heart, a, a, an apple was added. That violence can be manifested in many ways. We are talking about psychological, symbolical, and also uh, the L LGBT phobia. 
and we can end up having a lovable side. And also, as a violence for us lesbian women, it's important to talk about the corrective rape, which is a practice that is powered by the intolerance, and it ends up placing lesbian women in a place as if our sexuality would only be there because we hadn't had a man that allowed us to understand ourselves as women and i am being very nice in the way i'm saying here so the corrective rape is a a practice that is here because we are in a uh, lesbophobia and patriarchal society and uh, in addition to all the other problems and that come from structural lesbophobism that comes from what i was saying in the beginning that violence is even greater when associated to classes and races and also uh, it has to do with the monetary power a black lesbian woman even more vulnerable because of structural racism and this is a really a harder situation for these bodies and these lives we also had in sao paulo luana barbosa that was renowned a, a black um, lesbian mother that was beat in front of her son and she died five days later and we do not have anyone uh, responsible for having done that we can also mention marielle's case uh, the counselor she was my partner and she was the victim of a political feminicide and four years after her murder the state has not responded um, who killed her and we here see a political message it was a silencing message of the advancement of everything she represented and her body and also her life trajectory a black woman a lesbian a feminist the message you hear is the effacing of these of this agenda and it shows that you know what is this body that can be in brazil today and which is the body that can live and which is the body that has to die so in light of that we should say that the message of the society about marielle's murder is that we are not going to step back here at the city council in rio de janeiro in 2017 marielle submitted a project to include the lesbian visibility day in the calendar of the city and this is not a project greatly discussed in the house but it was considered a controversial because um it was uh, submitted by marielle she lost it by two votes i resubmitted i also lost it last year by two votes and i am going to resubmit it again it's going to be in this week's agenda so that we can vote it and i will submit it as much as i need uh, until it is approved so we need to look at it and understand what does that mean the visibility protects and ensures citizenship with visibility you produce public policies why the city uh, council in rio does not want to recognize this visibility why everything that is related to gender or lgbt is always a huge political issue there is an advancement in conservatorism and not only in bolsonaro's administration we already saw Dilma uh, being the uh, suffering a, a coup, a uh, misogynist coup. So when we talk about the resistance and representativeness, we can be talking about anything. We need more women and politics. We need uh, more lesbians here. We have 50 city councils and very few lesbians so it's not only about having a feminist in power because if we have any woman we might have a damaris for instance so it's not just any woman but unfortunately in 2022 we are still working on resistance but also we are talking about uh the progress so that we can hope for a better future thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for your presentation. We are honored to have you here. I will open the floor for 
initial set of questions. So we usually have one question per speaker and we'll then ask, ask you to answer those. So a first question to Abigail. So we follow your uh, presentation and that's a combination of fiction and nonfiction and also your footprint in the academia is there. So I would like to ask you how, how those things relate to you, uh, that narrative uh, thought, how does that connect to, to the academia, to, to the concept uh, practice and, and philosophy? And I, I know that's your field as well. That's the question I have for you, Abigail. Bruno, for you, I also would like you to comment. You, you talked about the speculative environment, the artistic environment, that that struggle, that uh, dispute uh, for words. And I would like to ask you about uh, the relation of that and the material life of, of those people that go to Casa One to, you know, look, uh, food, very, very basic things for a shelter and how how do you see that combining with that subtle aspect that you discussed in your uh, talk and finally monica i have a question you talked about the creation of a day but what other legislative measures are feasible you are there any well succeeded experiences in brazil to improve the lesbian lgbt visibility how the brazilian legislative area or the uh, legislative um, council in rio is working on such important topics and, and such important agenda so abigail you, you may start please Thank you, Guilherme, for your question. Well, this combination for me is a first, the result of a movement and a transition, maybe. More than something that stems out from a finite position and also that's why i say that i move around philosophy and art as a way to establish my creations which are artistic and political and existential i do not separate those dimensions i usually uh, work on that to try to to distance myself from the identity policies that establish not only in terms of gender or sexuality but also in terms of knowledge and professional when i say i'm an artist i'm a poet we are defining an identity and to move away from identities has been something existential because identities especially the marginalized ones are a movement that allow me that have allowed me um, to be alive but they are also in the colonial game their creation of colonization so we need to know how that creates a different um aspects there but the relationship with writing and and then i understand that it's not things are not only in the word words and the language differently from the european white rationale to understand the language um, as a written or or a word and i understand that this is in, a, in an area that is broader than that and i also have seen that and I've, I've been finding this in when I uh, meet my black studies and, and I've been studying 
and a waterfall. I'm, I'm studying here in Rationalize MEC. I'm studying and when I am at a candle and so I learned this multiple dimension uh, and I can remember and rewrite the story of my life uh, based on this extended uh, understanding of text. I remember that when I was a child in order to escape cis uh, and hetero violence from school and I had just uh, changed schools. I'd go to the to the reading room of that public school to escape cis hetero violence. And that's where I found comic strips. And so I read the Monica comic strip to spend uh, time there and escape from these uh, place of violence where uh, masculinity violence was imposed on my body. So there was this uh, flight and welcoming. As a child, my mom was spiritualist. She had many books and I was raised with all those books and I even found it a bit strange in smaller towns or in the outskirts. I thought my mom was a little nerdy because in my friends, in my family, um, the other relatives in their homes, there were no books. But this in a way nourished my imagination. I also remember my dad telling us stories of his dad, our grandpa. He walked 10 kilometers every day to go to school, rain or shine. He, my grandfather, who was also racialized, he was Caboclo or, or indigenous and, and black. So I have this uh, ancestral relation with learning and words and texts. Then later in life, I started studying texts about politics and I was also involved in the movement against the uh, price uh, raise in bus tickets and in uh, when I lived in Niteroi, in, in uh, close to Rio de Janeiro, and then after I joined or got to university, these spaces of knowledge where you had these words, this these this has been a tool I used for survival. So the way I relate to art and universities and my relationship with art and in art with poetry and in academia uh, with philosophy. So I use these tools to build a position where I escape this world that tries to uh, destroy me and they try to erase me, efface me, to obliterate my history. It's also my blood and my flesh that they try to destroy and I try to in this transition between these knowledge domains I've also built trajectories of prosperity of freedom and memory thank you thank you for your answer Bruno over to you Thank you for your question, Guilherme. I think uh, Abigail is saying everything. She's such a great thinker and she has already kind of prepared, laid the ground for my answer. First, there's no subtle uh, elements in this clash, the semantic or lexical dispute might be subtle in a museum on the museum floor but on the street this clash of words is one of hunger of thirst of violence so studying them 
means. I mean, thinking about these clashes, they also require a broadened notion of knowledge, not only text or texts. I try to talk about thinking and doing, and that's your groundwork. And in this game, this clash is or takes place in the in all these structures across the board. So here we see uh, it complies with the rules, but in the rally of the world, it takes place everywhere. So what is art? What is life? What is death? What can be death? What is not death? All these issues, they also unfold on the ground of life without necessarily being dressed in words, like we're doing here, discussing all these images on this platform and everything. So this is, uh, is there all the time. It, it takes place everywhere. Thank you, Bruno. I'll now uh, turn it over to Monica. Thank you, Guilherme. Thank you for your question. In institutional policies, as a councilwoman, of course, there are uh, limits uh, to what a member of parliament or a council councillor can do in the city. Now, just stirring up debate in this in, in a place that doesn't that, that is refractory to this discussion to this debate is already important when we talk about the lesbian visibility uh, we had this bill we spent three sessions discussing it was that a show of uh, lesbophobia and of course it was but then when we talk to other councillors that were on the other side at the other end of your political spectrum just promoting this debate in the uh, town council was very important because that's where you find real politics, politics that will affect people's lives. So having lesbian visibility there means we're starting a dialogue with civil society and in the uh, city council that were uh, that was forced to discuss something that should never be discussed in their view, in their views. And then we also project presented a bill against femicide and the scope of the project was of LGBTs and recognizing lesbos side and also to put in place a, a bill with a program to fight femicide. And that included gender issues, including trans women and transvestites. And again, the city council tried to remove this bill of the uh, discussion. And then uh, this uh, attempt to stop it was defeated. So we approved the, the program, including trans women and transvestites. We also approved the day to fight against femicide, which was the day after the murder of Marielle. And this public debate, when it is from the inside out, we just uh, stir up debate and that increases visibility. So building debate with the with lesbian movements, the feminist movement and LGBT movements in general, this is crucial. And this is an important landmark. It means political gains for this agenda. In addition, in an election year, it should be pointed out that we need to elect more lesbian women, more LGBT people. And that means uh, our representativeness. We need to go, uh, or, or a democracy goes hand in hand with diversity. Thank you, Monica. I now have some questions from the audience. And I'll try, of course, to stick to our uh, lunch break. First question to Bruno. Bruno, can we 
think about LGBT territories? How do physical spaces have moved LGBT bodies in the city of Sao Paulo? We also got two questions to Monica, and I'll try to um, join them together in one. Good morning. I'd like to ask Monica about the intersections between policies or politics and museums, how to take the debate on lesbian people to museums and to Monica again, how can the issues that are discussed in museums reflect legislative political issues? So again, the intersection between politics, museums and legislative and uh, lesbian issues in the museum. So Bruno, can you start? And then we will uh, have Monica. And again, please send more questions. We are still receiving uh, your questions. I don't know who asked the question, but I'd like to thank you for sending this question. This is a question about clashes, about dispute, it also means uh, maybe this question should be also asked to Monica because I think we should understand also what purpose does this uh, serve? What, it, what does it mean to describe a territory as LGBT territory? So these uh, ideas always state something about some issues, but not on others. So when we talk about public policies and about access, and also even an art show, like, like or even a seminar like this, like Histories of Diversity, the seminar, we should also uh, consider that this may be always necessary, but it's never enough. When you think about one particular territory, it's never enough to encompass and to summarize any sort of experience that involves it. When you talk about LGBT territory, I might think about the city of Sao Paulo, the Aroshi Republica or Angabaú districts. But this also includes effacing or erasing other territories and other experiences that might involve this dissidence and also diversity. I think we should always discuss and, and reflect upon this dispute of territories and words in a, a strategically. This is all, always a a uh, negotiation, an ongoing negotiation. It uh, means making some things visible. It means taking other things. And this is something we should always remember. And this might be key to some people, the key to some spaces, the key to some practices. There's always this complexity, that which is out and also that which can or should be seen or shared. And why are we doing this? Why do we do this? And also the dimension of, uh, or the notion of territory. I may even turn it over to Monica if she wants to take the ball, if you will, or take the cue. How can this be strategic to public policy discussions or access to rights anyway. Thank you. All right, let's turn it over to Monica. Guilherme, I'll try to draw a parallel here. We know museums are still very conservative spaces. And there's a history of censorship in some places of some artworks. So as a conservative space that does censorship, art is always 
a discussion of, of the status quo. So I'd even uh, dare to say that we need to be more representative, but how many creators uh, should include more women when we have more women curators as well? So for me, this is really important because it will provoke many other things. Those that are watching us and those that are discussing this. And what Bruno and Abigail said, they have triggered this debate. So this space uh, where this contradiction arises, do we need to address this to make progress in the feminist agendas to increase our uh, representativeness? We need artworks that are also created and also represent LGBT people. This is crucial and this is something that uh, I mean, we had some uh, such artworks being censored. Brazil has very, a very short memory that's also very weak. And maintaining this weak, this memory weak is a project of power. A country that is not based on the fight for truth and justice. It means no historical atonement, not with the genocide of the indigenous and the black peoples. All the debate on the violence of slavery and starting this dialogue is crucial in a democracy, in a real democracy. Diversity needs to be everywhere, including the museums. Thank you. I'd also like to add this question or, or include a big in the answer to this question of the dimension of museums she was discussing escapism and flight also i just trying to remember the words that she used so an environment that welcomes you but also one uh, of a of, of material existence so where would museums be in your practice in your views in your writings what are the potentials and what are the limits of museums in your worldview thank you guilherme oh just a second i'm kind of clumsy here right the space of museums in my practice. I'm leaning toward giving you an answer that is both contradictory and also a bit radical. And between the non existent and the new. new because uh, just a while ago in a very recent period that's when i stepped on the first museum in my life like what four or five years ago that's when i i was in the first museum uh, it was in 2015 i think uh, michelle matthews and jota mumbasa i mean they were making an uproar to get into the Sao Paulo Biennale, just getting in, they wanted to be there. And although they're there today and are showing their work, so that's how I also entered museums when friends of mine got access and could show their work there. And this is highly symptomatic. I'm one of the organizers of the Marginalia uh, movement, a poetry for trans people, a poetry movement that is held in the São Bento uh, region in Sao Paulo. We had a virtual online residency last year and 90% of the participants had never participated in an art residence. They'd never been to a museum and these are artists. We're talking about poets. So you see, uh, you see how far we are. You see the size of the gap between museums 
and the life of trans uh, racialized racialized trans people and this i've been getting increasingly closer to museums and art galleries and but this is still contradictory and very dense when you go to these places most black people that are there are just servants they're uh, serving you and when you have trans people they're not curators sometimes uh, as receptionists uh, you have like uh, uh, people uh, as a uh, reception it's okay and when you think about what monica said that these positions are also taken or rather that museums are seeking increasingly more diversity and so we should take crucial positions in museums and galleries and all institutions. And I think that this diversity that museums and art institutions are trying to get close to, which are these diversities then? The gender diversity, women, trans people, sexual diversity, lesbians, um, bisexuals, racial diversity is uh, African-American, Indian people. So looking at this diversity in Brazil, and Brazil is um, a whitish um, uh, European machine that uh, builds prosperity out of uh, annihilation. So these are uh, really uh, different things. So, and what is uh, the idea here is really radicalism, Indians, um, black and lesbians, LGBT, and the, all of these people need the radicalism because with, without being radical, they cannot survive. And, and they can change the materiality that um, works on top of them to destroy them. So for museums and art institutions, if, if they want to get close to the diversity, the museums and the art institutions need to develop means of welcoming the radicalism. We need to welcome radical. If you, if you want, that to be part of your agenda you need to welcome radicalism because radicalism is a a vital tool for that and by welcoming this radicalism you you need to perform a structural change in the museum you have to review data codes positions uh due dates uh, the way you address people the way you talk the museums need to restructure themselves. So we need to welcome that, this diversity. And, and then you have to uh, welcome radicalism and, and also being able to be changed by the political forces that the radicalism uh, conveys. And if museums and institutions are able to do that, and I know this is not easy to do, but I think then we will have a, a lot of power in this movement. Radicalizing what I'm saying, can you imagine a museum that has curators and we have people that are willing to radicalize? How can we work on that? We develop mechanisms and see what can these changes bring? A lot of things, transformational things, but that's it the transformation that the radicalism demands a lot of times they go against the structure the pillars of the museum and then we have a contradiction that can't be solved and that's the problem for museums in in dealing with radicalism because it might not be interesting to work around these structures to change these foundations especially because people profit from that and they profit a lot. So there is a challenge, which is the radicalism challenge that going in and knocking everything down and the museum willing or not, 
uh, to change and how can I welcome that, try to change, but at the same time to have that type of dialogue because the highest you go in this pyramid, you get close to the conservatorism. So I see that as a contradictory situation. I am in a contradictory situation. I'm, I'm making an interesting amount of money, but those that are on top, they are making millions, millions. Um, and what I'm making is nothing. It's very different from what the higher rank people in the museum make. So uh, it is a contradiction, but it's a, a strong contradiction. And if there are people that are willing to change, I urge you, please try to welcome the radicalism and allow yourselves to be changed by the radicalism. May I add? Of course, I think that uh, what Abigail is saying is very interesting and important because the idea of transmutation uh, it has to do with uh, even n not being a museum anymore. And that's important. When you welcome radicalism, you also welcome the possibility of uh, allowing that no longer being what it is. Now talking about a uh, mask and I think about Lena and the, with the architectural uh, design and she had that opening area in the bottom and she placed the, the building on top of it so and it can become something else so that's what i what i think you might change structures and it might be something that is apparent it might be the ceiling it might be the way you work and and also we have people here we have the production team we have the interpreters here that there are contracts people are contracted by this institution also guilherme uh, as part of this institution so welcoming this radicalism is not only cannot be only a a topic a a theme but it, it has to be present in the structure and you know the museum might even lose its current characteristics and when we talk about queer stories and i'm going back to the to the main topic here that's always needed that idea of um uh, queer stories that is needed that's necessary but it's not that's not enough just like you know people asked about territories and like Monica is talking about political disputes and once again, everything is needed, everything is crucial, but they will be never enough to address the structural dimension of these violences. Also in, under an intersectional perspective to talk about diversity, we have to talk about a lot of stuff. We could have had a round table on the queer stories to talk about public transportation, for instance, or water access in the city. And this should be part of this agenda. I got carried away with, with the topic of this knocking the, the door down. Well, we are reaching the end of our panel. Monica, I don't know if you have a final comment. Well, I when Abigail says welcoming radicalism, I think in the current political situation, this is something that we should do for life. We are in a moment where we have to reinvent ourselves as Brazilians. So to welcome boldness and radicalism is crucial, I believe. Very good. So with these final remarks and, and questions and answers, I now end this first session, unless someone has any anything to say. But we did have a, a whole set of wonderful ideas, a great debate. I would like to invite you to remain with us in the afternoon. It's going to start at 2.30 p.m. And also in tomorrow's sessions that uh, are also part of our program. Once again, Abigail, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Monica, for this amazing conversation 
and we'll follow with your stories in the afternoon. See you later. Thank you.
Olá, boa tarde a todos. Todas. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniela Rodriguez, assistant curator for the Mass Museum. We have special guests today, guest speakers, and I'll be the mediator. It's the second panel of histories of diversity. It's the second seminar before the next themes that will be worked on by our curator team in the next few years. I'll just describe myself briefly. We have some problem here. Can you hear me? Let me just close this for a second. Right. So um, I apologize. So I'll describe myself briefly. I'm a white woman with uh, straight, short hair just below my shoulders. I have a cactus plant on my right, uh, left hand side. I'm wearing gray and I'm the mediator of the section panel. We would were expecting three guest speakers, but unfortunately, Fernando Navi couldn't participate and he asked us uh, to apologize on his behalf. He had a personal issue. So this afternoon we'll have the presentation by Cynthia, Cynthia Schopfer and the one by Mahmoud Kaleh. Caleb, we have some messages. We can have three audio channels. You can listen to this in English, Portuguese, or Spanish, and the translation in sign language is also being provided. The Q&A session will be at the end of the two presentations. You can send your questions on the, the chat section. So I'll now introduce Cynthia and then give her the floor. Cynthia Schaffer is a photographer and she has a PhD in American studies in Santiago de Chile and also a postdoctoral researcher in the same institution. Her research focuses on photography, archives and feminism. She's an activist for the Coordinadora Feminista 8M organization and a member of the Laura Rodick Brigada de Arte and Propaganda. She's currently uh, she currently belongs to the Conceptualismus del Sur network and is in charge of their archives division. She was also the curator of the photo exhibition Nuestra Urgencia versus Vencer on the archive of women's struggle against dictatorship. And she was also co author with Kenna Lorenzini of the book Nuestra Urgencia por Vencer. So I'll now turn it over to Daniela. Thank you very much for introducing me. And first, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to give a presentation in this seminar. I'd also like to thank everyone who participated in the production of this seminar, the translators, and absolutely everyone that made this possible. I'll try to stick to my time limit and then uh, so that everyone can speak. I'd like to start discussing my trajectory as a researcher and also curator who has been focusing in the field of photography, archiving and feminism, particularly in Chile. And this area has been crossed by other vital and political dimensions working as a LGBT activist and political activism in the Laura Rodig uh, organization and this collective of art and propaganda that's also uh, in Santiago del Chile. And then I have organized work 
strategies to think about the urgency of activating a more political voice in different contexts of violence. And I want also to be present in all these shared spaces where we can tighten our bonds, our resistance and our memories. Also the possibility of working on legitimacy models and displacements in the connection between politics and poetics for us to manifest ourselves in all dimensions and also to activate ourselves and to make ourselves visible. When you think about the invitation to this seminar to focus our gazes on diversity, in particular in Santiago del Chile, presenting a reflection on this dialogue with institutions, with art groups, and also with activism. I'll now share my slides. Okay. So in this presentation, I'll be showing you the memorial of the dissidents in the San Borja Park in the center of Santiago. I wouldn't be able to continue without reminding you of Daniel, who died dead at 24 years in the periphery, in the outskirts of our city. He was murdered. And this hate crime, in this time during all these years, it triggered a broad discussion on the violence that dissidents are uh, the victims of and the and also the fact that there is discrimination and four months after his murder we had a new law that uh, we know is not enough and in this place in the north of the park we built this place where Daniel was murdered and we have a lot of dissident voices there and everyone also the people that are working on this also suffer the idea is also to make sure that this is present in the public space and after his murder this year we have 10 years after his death so we have this memorial of dissidents, dissidents, and from there we can go as far as the external, the outer walls of the park. So there was this mural where you have signs that are associated with uh, sex and dissidents. And we try to recover the lives of the people and also the memory of the people ha that have dissident practices and sex practices and on a part of its surface we claim this space as a site of memory lgbt memory lgbtq plus memory and this has become unfortunately uh, is this at the center of a controversy on the representation of sex in public spaces, a controversy that is promoted by the press and some uh, reports that have become viral in social media. I'd like now to share this case for many different reasons. First, because I am interested in it, exposing this memory generated by these groups that want to sustain and support the dissident memorial in the park also for these groups to make visible their existence and their sexuality and their uh, affections and emotions and also a place of disagreement that goes beyond the limits of official history because it goes beyond a, a social and sexual mandate number two I'm also interested in making visible all the 
activation practices in this around this memorial, like guided tours that are organized by the LGBTQ collective. The idea is to produce a uh, show images of all these collective uh, collectives or, or groups that are part of this space. Number three, I'm also interested, especially in uh, deactivate some uh, hegemony, hegemony framing that was uh, put there to um, increase censorship. And also in this presentation, I won't show you all the pictures, but we have photos that when they are enlarged, like fragments of these walls, especially the wall of desires of one of the collectives that show their works there, it changes completely the scale and the frame and the perspective. And this led to an escalation of violence against these collectives. This final point is probably the most critical because these uh, framings and perspective became viral, including children and teenagers as subjects of uh, risk by these images. So these images were shown and conservative sectors claimed that this mural was visual violence against children and uh, teenagers. So considering this situation also a process of internal reflection on March the 21st, before the opening of the memorial, there was an intervention on the mural. And in the early hours of uh, Tuesday, they were uh, covered in white paint and then lots of messages, Catholic and anti-communist hate messages were written there. And then the city government covers in white paints the remainder of the mural, effacing or erasing its uh, role as uh, a place of memory, of LGBT memory. And these collectives and dissident activists, they all, always have this condition of a space of memory that is delayed so what is the most violent thing, the drawings or the erasing? Is there violence that's more significant than others? Visual violence had a greater impact in these groups than the physical violence that the LGBT members suffer. As a result, this memorial starts a discussion of a memory that is in dispute with legality. How can you really work on this memory that is displaced, that will challenge any uh, discourse on inclusion? But then there are other questions about where these memories are, these crooked trans, transgender memories are of the bodies of people of this language of disagreement. What is the territory for them to manifest, for us to manifest our lives? The walls of this memorial, for many weeks, they were intervened in many different ways. They were vandalized with hate speeches, hate words, but they were also carefully restored and they were also at uh, support messages were written there. So this resistance or inst insistence of the people or artists ended up creating an open wall. So this place, material space led to a fight for life, for our lives, but also for the lives of all the groups, many people that were involved in this activity. And this is a place that 
makes this uh, become violence and censorship, a censorship that prefers to keep this and to inherit the problem of taking a position outside the patterns and rules and also getting away from this progressive moral that is present for some things, but not for others. They deny to be part of others. Now, when you resume the trajectory or history of this uh, memorial, some of these images should be put into context, and I should uh, explain how it was conceived. This radical gesture that makes it possible for us to have collective creation, a force that leads to this memory of a present that really shows images of dissidents, like with a LGBTQ plus map that holds many different art expressions and also in a public space that generates a whole circuit that will expand this exercise of living memory and critical thinking for and uh, from these LGBTQ plus communities. And also the idea was to make this memorial as a landmark of cultural and heritage relevance that leads to this, to it being preserved and remembered. And finally, there are 12 artists who formerly were part of the creation of this memorial and gave it shape in these two days. So again, this, our collective participated and then we are now calling erotic dissident, erotic artists that can create this wall of desires and then leave it open leave a door open for other collectivities, other groups to participate. And also through an open uh, folder for everyone that wants to contribute to this. And I'm really interested in identifying the potential of this agreement that was limited in collect in collectivity as ways of symbolic productions and also the preservation of memory and how you open spaces for dissidence and disruption in public spaces so is it worth asking oneself what are the current conditions for social cultural feminist dissident criticism that goes hand in hand with processes of acceptance on different public levels. We know that on the one hand, we should insist on this need of reaching agreements against uh, the uh, mainstream trends that try to deny conflict. But then on the other hand, we know, we also know that some uh, new liberal management, uh, management uh, or government managers want to make this inhabitable for any rebels, just making this for uh, cis hetero people. The project of this memorial, this dissident memorial in the in the open air is not just about building a memorial there. In addition, there were also mediation. There was also mediation for those that wanted to visit this. And then we had also guided tours organized by the collective groups for people to create links with this territory for the communities that live there and pass through these places. And also education efforts that could highlight the importance of these spaces with our images and also for spaces that are free from hate speeches. And when you create reports and narratives, this was at the center of this effort. In addition, we generated mediation material that included descriptions of these murals 
of the artists and also the definition of policies for each group in their fight. So there was this effort to unlearn conventions and hegemonies and also to get lost or rather uh, have other voices and other memories and also have the plasticity of life and the borders between sex and policies and also sex practices. So those that this violent intervention trying to erase the memorial tried to suffocate all possibilities of discussion and dialogue uh, bringing in a, a division between private and public, a censorship and moral and all normative effects that we already know from such an attitude. Thus, we here have the same organizations that were behind this wall and that complained, they say. What hurts is the censorship, moral panic, and the anguish that drives criticism to groups before trying the antidotes that they might raise. Hurtful are the sexual boundaries that uh, ban non-reproductive sexual practices and that relegate non-represented ones. And now to, to end, my presentation, I would like to go back to the idea that I mentioned in the beginning. When we think about deactivating the hegemonic framework and also working with this snapshot and this expanded snapshot that we saw in this wall and that was also published in the hegemonic press and the social medias. And we see that, you know, in the WhatsApp groups that I'm part of, and uh, I, I try to understand what kind of view, what kind of understanding they have from that. I, I believe there is an urge to recover the place, the area with the images that the militants and the artists wanted to share in this wall. I'm sorry, I went too fast on my slides. So this exercise aims not only at showing or sharing this desire of manifestation, but also an exercise of self-determination, self-determination of this memory living behind not only a vision, but also any sexism norm or a patriarchal uh, rule. The idea would be to develop a short circuit in the hegemonic patriarchal economies. But in addition to that, I would like to, to bring to you a, a file that was shared via the Instagram account. I think these devices work in the self-managed a construction of memory. I navigate, I check your stories, stories that I have shown you here in this presentation, just as an overview. I see these stories, these posts, and I see the trajectory of this wall, the path that was collectively built and in the first person. Here we can see a number of labels, of tags, of hashtags, of songs, images, and for this presentation, I brought some specific images and that, that show how important it is to have this effective and aesthetic view that requires art complicity, bringing this collective exercise to the present in our imagination, creating thus a dissident archive. And that's all. Thank you very much.
Pessoal, lembrando, agora... Thank you very much, Cynthia. Very interesting. I think now you can hear me well. I apologize for my prior technical problem. Everything is okay now, right? No echo. So I would like to take this opportunity to tell you that the chat is open. You can leave your question your questions at the end of the second presentation and we'll open the floor for a q a session and you know a conversation uh so you are welcome to send your questions your thoughts your comments now i would like to bring our second guest in the afternoon mahmoud kale he studied fine arts in alexandria in egypt and in norway he has a classical uh, degree and he's interested in formal composition as well as in the capacity of representing the theatricality of power. His relationship to fine arts education is critical and conversational. It informs an alternating ontological position where he either pronounces himself within the work as vocational voice or swaps announces himself within the work as vocational voice or swaps it for another head once performing the protagonist role of a painter flaneur or another time uh, the one of a non-curator of politically important memorial. His work complicates and appropriates forms to offer a virtual proposal that rethink justice and imagine possibilities for a redemptive future. He has been named a 2020 DAAD artist and residence in Berlin. Mahmoud, welcome, the floor is yours. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. And thank you for the introduction and for the invitation for everyone um, who uh, worked on uh, uh, making the conference possible. Um, just need to uh, turn on the timer so I don't uh, misuse the time. Um, that's uh, OK. It's not possible to do it. She will tell me if I go beyond. Thanks, everyone. and. Uh, yeah, I uh, would like to start by sharing the screen. So I'm not sure if you can see me now. Can you can see the screen? Yes? Yeah. Sure. Cool. So um, I'm, I've been very interested in house museums um, most of the time uh, since uh, several years. Um, this idea when a um, normal house becomes um, transformed into a form of an exhibition is a very interesting moment for me. And the power behind this transformation is also um, tells me a lot of stories about how history is written and who is writing that history. Uh, the idea of a house museum itself um, is almost feels like a trophy to a person um, who did something important to his own community of people. And um, the people later on wanted to bring this uh, favor back. So they transform his house or her house into a museum. Um, I've been trying to visit house museums in several cities when I travel. And um, it's uh, always, you know, when you, you want to see the house of your favorite poet and your favorite uh, painter, uh, important politicians. Um, and after several years and after a specific research uh, in 2016 I did on house museums, I realized that most house museums are made for um, mainly great men, um, great straight men. Uh, it's very rare when you find a house museum um, for a woman or for a queer person or for a refugee. It's always for a privileged uh, straight man. Not saying that the men who has house museums they didn't suffer in their life, they suffered, but in a different way. Um, so um, house museums like Lina Bobardi House Museum in Sao Paulo, for example, is a very rare example in the landscape of house museums in the world. Uh, so this idea was always an interesting um, question for me. And uh, also during the research, I realized that we the, always the house museum has to be for someone who is very famous, very known in history and politics and specific area in the history of humanity. 
and this person must be very well known. Um, so I did uh, an exhibition in um, 2014 in Cairo, in um, uh, um, a gallery in Cairo. It's called Painter on a Study Trip, and it was based on um, a house called uh, Palace Antoniadas Palace. And uh, it's owned by a man, um, Alexandrian Greek man, who has a French uh, citizenship, who is very um, um, famous and wealthy person uh, during the monarchy in Egypt. And he built this house with a beautiful garden that almost mimics the uh, style of the Versailles Palace. Um, and the king uh, of Egypt, uh, King Farouk at the time, was very fascinated by his house and wanted to take this house from him. So he gave it, the, he donated it to the, um, the, the, to the king. And then later on, when the 52 transformation, 1952 transformation happened and Egypt became a uh, republic, uh, not a monarchy, this house and the park became a public uh, property and was open for everyone. Uh, I did an exhibition about Houses Park, mainly my, my project was about Houses Park, was uh, used for fine arts students to uh, do landscape paintings as an assignment for their uh, painting training in the fine arts school, but it was always, for several generations, it was always known, I mean, it still is, the Antoniades Park. So the name of Ser Antoniades, or the, the, that rich man, was a kind of um, a, a, a memorialized, commem commemorated all the time for several generations by his name. So this idea of the owner of the house and the commemoration of his persona over the years uh, was very, very important for me. Um, so the exhibition was about a painting I found in, um, I, I encountered in the uh, Alexandria Fine Art Museum, which is also a palace that was owned by um, a very uh, wealthy Egyptian um, uh, collector. Uh, his name is Manasha, and um, he also gave it to the, um, the Republic later to the country. Um, so all most museums, at least in Egypt, where I grew up, uh, they were houses of great men before. And this was always this idea was always very uh, embedded in my head. I was always wanted to think about this relation between these amazing, overwhelming um, architectural buildings, super fancy houses, and the name of the man they used to own it, and uh, the commemoration of that person. Um, no matter how the use of this house is different, it's becoming a museum, the collection is becoming a public collection, it became a conference hall, something else, but still the name of that man is always there. So I wanted for uh, several times, I wanted to do my own imagined house museum. Uh, how can I imagine this um, um, situation? So in 2017, I uh, did a piece called Proposal for a House Museum of an Unknown Crying Man. And um, it's based on an incident that uh, took place in Cairo on May 11, 2001, uh, when um, 52 young men were arrested from a um, gay uh, discotheque um, on a boat in Cairo, on the Nile in Cairo. Uh, this was somehow kind of like the stonewall moment of Egypt. Uh, for the queer community. Uh, to this year uh, marks the 22 anniversary of this, um, 21, I think, um, of this incident. And there, is, there was a, a specific image that came out of this uh, history of this incident that got stuck in my head and the head of my generation of queer um, people. Um, that I always wanted to go back to it and think about it. So I'll go to this image um, here. So just to give a context for uh, what happened. So on May 11, 2001, uh, this group of 52 young men were arrested and they were sent to, um, to the police station uh, immediately. Uh, the media was uh, totally orchestrated at that time. So the day after, in the morning, all their images, uh, names, addresses, and occupations were published, released in uh, the newspapers. 
and basically they were outed. Uh, they were exposed to a forced outing and uh, a lot of torture and that happened during the interrogation and um, um, the, the process of the case. And there was a specific um, scene, everything was very theatrical and orchestrated. So the 52 men, when they were leaving the police car and entering the courtroom, they were met with um, a group of paparazzis. They wanted to take pictures of them in order to publish it as photos for the reports uh, on the newspapers. And uh, in order for them to protect the some sense of privacy and for their identity, they covered their heads with their uh, with white piece of cloth. So most of them, they even took, cut their t-shirts, cut their prison uh, uniform and covered their uh, faces with it. So one day in the morning, we woke up. I remember I was still in college uh, at the time. And I remember waking up in the morning, seeing images like this in the newspaper with, of course, a lot of um, uh, melodramatic titles about how gay people live and um, the arrest of the biggest you know, group of gays in the country. And this is uh, what the government is trying to, to do to protect family values and um, ethical values in society. And uh, I remember for um, many people seeing these images uh, that are very abstracted images. Um, it was very important for everyone to think that I don't want to be that person one day. I don't want to wake up in the morning and see my you know, um, image in a newspaper like this. So this delayed the coming out process for uh, several people. Uh, we're talking about 21 years um, past since, since this incident happening, happened. And also the fact that this very, this specific image now that we're seeing, um, this specific image, you can see that it's a close up of one of these, you know, um, um, shots. And it's a very, I call it a very poor image. It's very low res, it's very abstracted. We don't see anything in this picture. We don't see the identity of the person. We don't see his face. We only see his hand, his ear, and part of his hair. Uh, we don't even know where. But this image became an icon, a stock image in the economy of photojournalism. So for 20 years, every um, newspaper, um, um, news agency, The Guardian, CNN, BBC, whenever they want to write a piece about queers in Egypt or the gay scene in Egypt, they use this image as a cover for their stories. So this abstracted image of a person that we all don't know became an icon, became an icon like almost like a religious icon, like Jesus. Uh, this very um, unknown person represented a, a, a very important group uh, of people in society at a certain time and place. Uh, the image is very abstract, very poor, but it's very politically and emotionally loaded. The image stuck in my head for several years and I wanted so much uh, to work on it, to unfold it, to imagine some sort of you know, emotions and life behind this image. Uh, and then this working on this image was working on parallel with my interest on house museums and how house museums can commemorate a certain man or a person um, in a very powerful way. So the idea was to, um, the idea of the work that I'm talking about right now is to think of, to imagine a proposal for a house museum, for a memorial, for one of the victims that uh, the, the, they were arrested, one of these 52 uh, young men. Uh, of course, very important part of the story we knew from the Human Rights Watch report that was published one year after the incident. And this was, I remember, like a horror book for everyone who read it. Um, so based on the report and several um, testimonies that we um, got from people, we kept this, this idea of, um, the state violence and what the state violence can do to gay men kept growing for several years in our hearts and minds. Uh, the work is trying to think about this moment when maybe 30, 40 years from now, when the world can might be a better place, hopefully. 
someone decide to make uh, a memorial and to say sorry for what happened to one of the victims of the 52 victims. What this memorial would look like. It's very clear that it's a proposal. It's not an actual museum. It's a performative institution that can only perform in art exhibitions. It doesn't pretend to be an actual. Um, there's something sc scares me about actual memorials and having the, 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 the power to do an actual memorial. So I prefer to think about it, to propose it, to imagine it other than rather than doing it. So uh, the work called the Proposal for a House Museum of an Unknown Crying Man, and it's basically a, an abstract translation of the photojournalistic image that I was talking about before. Um, the house took place in um, the 15th Istanbul Biennial uh, in 2017, and um, I can play a film right now that can that gives you an idea about the whole house museum, and then I'll be available for um, the Q&A. Thank you so much. This house was the emotional and social refuge of our protagonist, who moved here from Cairo more than a decade ago. His identity as an unknown crying man was established in the Egyptian media after he attended a party that was raided by the police. The incident would later become known as a historical event and a day to remember for several generations to come. In the Jihangir neighborhood, happy young men who danced on a floating structure on the Nile in the Zamalek district in Cairo on May 11, 2001. After being arrested, the 52 young men were sent to court. When entering the court building, they would cover their faces with white cloths in order to shield their faces from the many paparazzi desperately trying to reveal their identities. The image of a covered male face is well known in the collective memory of Egypt. In the memory of the LGBTQI, the image of the unknown crying man soon became an icon representing those who practice their love in a different way. The mirror itself looks no different than those standing in the entrances of average middle class houses in Cairo, a place where both visitors and family members check their reflection before entering or leaving the house. One of the places the crying man visited when he first arrived in the city was the famous Floria Atatürk Marine Mansion, which was a presidential summer residence of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. The style and location of this house made a deep impression on the crying man, and he immediately wanted to recreate a similar environment for himself. We can see this clearly in the taste and style of the entire house, starting from the living room. The central piece of furniture kept in this room is the crying man's niche or glass cabinet. As a furniture piece, his niche functioned as a cabinet of curiosities. It reinterprets the traditional ornate vitrines typically found in bourgeois family houses in Egypt, displaying personal objects, china, or photographs of important family events. The cabinet of the crying man instead displays a set of small scale frame photographs showing abstracted crops of wild but lush landscapes. The photographs are depictions of Mont Chouic Park,
dining table and two chairs, as if our crying man was entertaining the idea of receiving a guest or imagining that he would share his life with a special someone. The table, however, is prepared. Man kept only two dining chairs. He owned a full set of plates with this motif. The original painting was made by Giovanni Bragolin, but there are now numerous alternative versions of this image, all showing portraits of tearful young boys. As with other objects in the house, the painting of the crying boy was a household item, often to be found in middle-class homes in Egypt, where a crying man was growing up. Before we go on, please pay attention to the painting on the wall. It shows a still life of dying fruits. The crying man painted this. We know from the neighbors that the subject was of great interest to him and was one to which he regularly returned. On several occasions, the neighbors saw him leave the unfinished canvases with variations on the same theme outside his house to be picked up with the trash. The one hanging in this room is the only painting we know that he kept. And although it also remains to be unfinished, it shows his best attempt at capturing the slow process of decomposition. Please proceed to the piano in the hallway. The piano. This piano was one of the first objects delivered to the house after the crying man moved in. Ever since the first night it arrived, the neighbors could hear him playing it in the evenings. He would never play for very long, and it would always be a short and fragmented composition of vaguely familiar melodies that they could not quite identify. On top of the piano, he placed several studies and sketches of the Bragolin crying boy motif mentioned in the dining room. The crying man commissioned and collected these drawings in an attempt to get closer to the process and motivation behind this haunting image, which had made such impact on him as a child. His diary state his wish to understand the impersonal production of the sense of truth the image contains and how it is accessible to everyone. Before entering the second floor, we invite you to visit the shower area, which is located on the right side of the staircase. The shower. The glass ceiling in this room made the shower the only place in the house which allowed the neighbors a glimpse into the daily routines of the crying man. They would see him entering the shower twice every day, once in the morning, and once in the evening. With each shower, he would rewatch his favorite seven minutes from a film on the only TV screen in his house. The film now playing is called Tol Amri, or All My Life. It was made by the Egyptian filmmaker Maher Sabri. While being a work of fiction, Sabri made efforts to include real life events and data from a detailed report by Human Rights Watch called In a Time of Torture. The film reminded the crying man of the life and stories he once shared with his friends in Cairo and of how their intimacy and love had become part of an existential and political struggle. We now invite you to go back to the hallway and proceed to the staircase that will lead you to the second floor. The second floor. This floor holds the rooms where a protagonist used to read, think, and sleep. The first object we see is what he called a proposal for a romantic sculpture. It was commissioned by the crying man as a perfect imagined gift for himself. The crying man was deeply fond of the song Ne me quitte pas by Jacques Brel which you can hear playing now, as it so often could be heard coming from the house. He loved this song so dearly that he wanted to give form to it. 
The sculpture includes a short film of a man having the title of the song tattooed onto his body. The tattoo inscribed on one's body asking a lover not to leave was, for the crying man, the idea of a perfect gift. One neighbor remembers that he saw the sculpture being delivered to the house at night, and in a rare glimpse of the crying man, could tell that he was very excited, hastily helping the deliverer carry it into the house. The crying man also acquired the leather jacket which hangs on the wall, never to be worn. It is reminiscent of the style usually worn by undercover policemen in Cairo. Please continue to the next room and dial 107. Study and Daybed. This is the study of the crying man. He commissioned a daybed to be in harmony with the other furniture in the house, not unlike that found in the Floria Atatürk Marine Mansion, thus connecting the private second floor to the first. The headboard makes the daybed suitable as a place for reading and relaxing, but not for sleeping. Here, the crying man would doze off in a state between wakefulness and dream. Over many years, the crying man collected uninscribed trophies for himself, made in precious materials such as crystal and gold. His collection reflects an ongoing interest and appreciation of aesthetics and minimalist art. But for him, the trophies were also present as a materialized longing for accomplishments that in his life had yet to come. On the other side of the room, you will be in the bedroom of the crying man. The bedroom. Please notice the two magnetically mounted circles above the bed. They were composed by the crying man as a personal interpretation of Felix Gonzalez Torres's artwork, Untitled Perfect Lovers, which shows two synchronized clocks placed side by side. Inevitably, one will get out of sync or stop before the other. In the version found here, we see two serving trays designed in stainless steel. They are exactly the same size, but one reflects its surroundings in gold, whereas the other in rainbow hues. They appear as identical, yet perfectly unsynchronized objects, beautifully reflecting their surroundings as two different images. The only items in the bedroom not placed there by the crying man are a series of photographs which were found in the basement of the house, but were obviously captured from this room. They remain the only evidence of how the crying man observed his own neighbors and surroundings. In his seclusion, the camera was an important tool for him to observe the world around him, while it also reflected a voyeuristic aspect of his personality. We are now almost at the end of our tour. Before you leave, we invite you to visit the final room in the house. Please follow the stairs back to the first floor and down to the basement at your own risk. Hello. Yes, thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you, Cynthia. That's so interesting to see both your talks and what is private that is shown in the house museum and then the memorial showing things in public spaces on the street. I will start with a question to you both. And this is, how can you elaborate on or expand on? Can you talk a bit more about this relationship between queer spaces that are public, like murals on the street and private spaces, queer, uh, private queer spaces in these uh, houses or house museums? So how can 
uh, queerness reshuffle these ideas or change these relations or interrelationship between the public and the private. So that's one first question that I'd like you both to talk about. All right. Can I start? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you again uh, for your question. Yes, it's true that, well, it's very clear that, that there's this stress or tension between public and private spaces. And that is uh, very interesting uh, to me when you explore these notions and what are the limits of public space? I believe that museums are also public spaces and uh, house museums are also public spaces, but then they have a different sort of visibility and uh, impact. When you see what takes place inside a house uh, walls, it also looked like a space with greater control. I don't know, like uh, where you have more control and greater possibilities, where you have stories and memories of, in all these images. Now, when you think about this space, uh, when you think about the walls around a park that's radically public and a park that is where you have lots of uh, claims, when you see civil organizations and community organizations and even municipal organizations so that you can trigger a controversy that was that focused on the limits of this public space in public spaces this limit relies on the impossibility of having any other memories except that memory that is more heteronormative or uh, hegemonical. So when you consider this uh, in visual terms, I'm really interested in, in uh, discussing this point. No matter how uh, what content you have in the memorial, uh, when you take it out of this context, you take a section of it and in a way you delete or erase or intervene on its content by shifting it out of context. For me, it's highly suggestive. It prevents any circulation or any reflection or the possibility of asking questions and also of having conversations around these issues. So any type of conversation, is uh, surrounded by censorship. So there is, in my opinion, something really radical. At least that's what I wanted to present. There is this element, element of uh, radicality. And this was for uh, something that was there for 10 years. And it there was attempt to destroy it, destroy destruction or other types of uh, interfering with it. And these material conditions that lead to circulation and the presence of other memories, it also challenges the limits of this space, a space that is also claimed by the uh, resident communities, the communities that live around it. And also something that's highly violent this year alone, we have many uh, reports of violence again against the community, that uh, the dweller community. And so the same communities that feel this and this possibility of uh, cultivating or grow, uh, this memory about our existence that in everything that we uh, suffer every day, when you consider the risks and when you consider the content of this memorial, this was a content of violence that in a way or another would make us subjects at risk, individuals at risk. And this was really 
at the core of this discussion that the memorial uh, dissidents just uh, put out. That was that's it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, for me. It's always uh, the public and private. The idea of what is public and what is private is. Uh, I always think about it as a hetero heteronormative kind of construct. Uh, it's made to uh, make it clear what has to be, what we need to see and do and listen to in public, and what we can do in private. And these things cannot intersect. And these are, you know, like two zones representing that. For for uh, queer people, the idea of public and private is already very paradoxed. It's more way more complicated than this. Your privacy is publicized, and your public life has to be privatized because you should not have a public life if you do this thing. So always in the discussion, when it comes to a political discussion, it's like, yeah, you do these things in your own home. We don't need to see it in public spaces. But if you do these things in your private spaces, your private spaces can be raided as well. Uh, so, or if you have your own private public space, like a discotheque, this discotheque can be raided and become an event that your images can be on newspapers all the time. Uh, so for me, this concept of what is public, what is private, as an artist, I'm always interested in all the efforts that people do, the, all the people, or us, everyone, to make, to find some sort of privacy in the public zone and how to make some political, radical public statement from the private zone. Uh, this, this is what makes it very interesting for me as an artist and the format that uh, of the work that I've been talking about, the, the medium itself, of a house museum, I think um, paradox, works on the paradox of this idea of public and private. You're entering a very private house, but it's open for public. But the, 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 the borders between public and private is very blurred. So you're entering the bedroom, you're entering the bathroom of that person, but you're not allowed to touch. You're almost so close to all the intimate spaces of that, you know, politician or dictator or, you know, poet or a queer person, whatever, whoever. But they, you don't know to what when to stop and when to go to an next room. And when 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 is allowed and when is not allowed, what is allowed and what is not allowed, it's completely blurred in this uh, zone, and that's why it's a, it's an interesting form for me. So it's also um, a, a way to in, in the work the the work that I've been talking about this idea of making the unknown public. It's basically we're memorializing the unknown, memorializing the person that we don't know that no one knows. We just know memorializing the person who is famous for being unknown, being famous for being covering his face and trying to protect his identity, trying to protect his privacy. And that's why he created a public image. So that, that's somehow how I think about it in your question. Uh... Okay, now I'm moving on. And based on your answers, I would like to know how the audience uh, uh, related to these spaces, these uh, places. How did the public receive these initiatives? Uh, how? that relationship has between artists and the communities. Cynthia talked a little bit about political and social media repercussions. And so I would like to ask you both about how this was perceived and how it was seen, how the communities relate to these works. Thank you, Daniela, for this question that allows me to add to uh, the, the explanation of our work. As I was saying in my presentation about the memorial, 
we not only have their the unfoldings and all the works and, and the wall and and the park but in addition to that with the organizations with uh, the art artists that participated in and these artworks and also in the convening of the space creations we also developed tours guided tours we developed a mediation process in the community that was guided that that was geared to address some uh, some uh, difficult topics but also aiming to discuss uh, other important issues and that is crucial because we have a displacement as you saw in my presentation and that part of the process uh, turns invisible because of the censorship process for me it's very important to say that because this presentation and the work that i've been developing uh, along with some organizations about the memorial all of that has as an objective to bring back and create other ways of telling these stories, not only in, the, in terms of the moral panic and censorship. And also the fact that, that all of that was just, you know, completely taken out of context. That repercussion, because of that effacing that we had, and because of the lack of possibility of understanding this memorial as a place of memory, a place that is claimed by people that are non-institutionalized, that is not managed. And I think that it's important to bring in mediation because that means to include in the development of that work a possibility of conversation dialogue opening discussion with the territories and communities that lived there or, or lived there apart people that are part of the dissident community and that can uh, allow uh, approximations create bounds or just visit the memorial and also something else that seems to be very important to me is that all the process where we build this report this is a report that has a life of its own and it is closer to those that created and that thought of that memorial and also closer to other uh, visibilization process by the means of statements and several other actions that have been carried out in order to allow this memory to have a room and allow Santiago to have a place like that. Unfortunately, though, the memorial did not last too long and it it did not allow us to have time to have this dialogue space. But there is something else that is still alive in this wall because it it became an open dialogue area and there was an intervention here and there uh, and that also has some effect and and uh, and people and the people that see that type of intervention in the public space people see it and also when we see that reaction coming from the different texts that are very that very that are you know different but I think that regardless of what happens to the memorial, it seems to me that it's important 
to maintain that area as a possible area for memories in which people that live there that they don't feel embarrassed and that they have no problems uh, with the, the wall being there and the wall being expanded and that that's not a problem. The wall starts because of the memory of this uh, young person that was murdered in the park, but we can expand it to other people. So what's going to happen to this memorial, we do not know yet. But the idea starts from uh, the idea is uh, to fight the the hate speeches, the the hate voices, and so that we can face them and go against them. And this is something that is still alive in the wall. And despite in the spite of censorship and despite of other interventions, we have here uh, an attempt uh, to dialogue. And I think that's it. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's very interesting that we're talking together in this panel because um, it's a completely two different uh, uh, forms of memorials and uh, the, the the interactions with it are completely different. Uh, I've been thinking a lot while you're speaking about the interaction um, with with the world, and I've been thinking a lot when I was working on on this piece about how the kind of audience and the reaction to it, we have to, of course, make it clear that it was, it's an artwork and an art exhibition. Um, it's not pretending to be ephemeral. It's very, it's, it's not permanent, sorry. It's not pretending to be permanent. It's uh, ephemeral. It's only for the time and duration of the exhibition. Um, still, I was quite worried about how people will, only queer people interact this work. Only queer, pe queer people will uh, relate to it, understand it, feel it. Uh, for me, this was a thing that I don't, I didn't want to. Uh, somehow, I wanted the piece to speak, to be more open, and have um, allow other people that um, they, they can deal with it in a different way. And I was very happy to see actually children very happy to spend time in that house, uh, be playing with the audio guide and taking pictures and selfies in the house. Uh, some students came um, and told me, yeah, it's very melancholic, but we don't feel sad for that person. For example, we feel proud of him that he managed to, you know, reflect stages in his own world, in his own exile in a way. And uh, speaking about exile, it's also important to mention that um, conceptually, the work is designed to take place anywhere in the world except Cairo because it's about not necessarily about censorship. Of course, that's part of the story as well, but it's about exile. These 52 young men, when they were uh, released after the court case, when, when it ended, they all asked for asylum and left Egypt because they couldn't live in Egypt after being outed in newspapers and media um, 20 years ago. Of course, that was very difficult. And they all asked for asylum. So we have 52 houses that can happen all over the world. It can be in Montreal, in San Francisco, in Sao Paulo, in Beirut, in different cities in the world. So this also influenced the conceptual structure of the work and the potentiality of it. Um, having said that, it's also important to mention that in Egypt, there's no queer history, okay? The community doesn't have, we're not allowed to speak. We're not allowed to have a history. The history is, cannot be tangible. Uh, the history is all memories in our head. We speak about it to each other, you know, but no one, we don't have a queer archive. There's no, you cannot publish, you cannot make a conference, you cannot do all these things. So, but still for me, when I was young and woke up in the morning and saw this image in the newspaper, this is still a very important moment, not only for Egypt, I think it was the biggest crackdown in gays, for gays um, in Africa. So I still believe that there is something that needs to be discussed here. And uh, after working for several years with my friends and my the other members of the community, I realized that there is no speak. I mean, of course, okay, we don't have this tangible materialized history in our hands. We're not documenting anything, but we also never had the chance to sit down 
and talk about it and discuss how our history is formulated, how the state violence is being is growing and how to deal with that. How this changed our the way we think about ourselves, identity and all these things. So this was the idea to make something that is completely imaginable. It's a proposed um, an institution, a proposed museum that doesn't really um, pretend that it's an actual one, but it's performing well to be a real museum. So when you go inside, it's but it's only only takes place in uh, in art exhibitions. So when you go inside, it, you feel that this performative institution, um, all the details, uh, sign of the museum, uh, the guards that has a uniform that it's a gift shop, but you still cannot purchase anything from it. Uh, things like that. So this was quite an interesting, for me, was like a possible way to open the, the door and allow other people also to engage. And I think this is something um, I learned uh, from Egypt, that we, you cannot speak about things in a direct way. Even if you want to talk about queer history, you have to make something completely, you know, um, you have to code it. You can't say things exactly how they are. Uh, just one last thing before I um, uh, I give you the stage. Uh, for example, we made a book about this museum. Again, it's a performative publication, like the performative institution. It's a book performing to be um, a catalog of a museum collection, but it's not. But it's it has also a text by human rights watch activists. Uh, law professors in Cairo, all the people that I, as an artist, learn a lot from their work in human rights field, but I never had the chance to sit down with them on a table and discuss how can we work together. So the book, I can just show you the cover. Um, the way we designed the book in order to have it in bookstores and escape the censorship, for example, uh, we this can be can act like a book, on, like an architecture book, you know, but it's, it's about all this event, the history of this event. So there is always something, we have to code things in order to open it up. So thank you. Oh, very interesting, Cynthia. Uh, if you have any comments, feel free to, to do so. And if you have questions to one another, feel free to ask them. We still have another question here from our audience. We are coming to the end of this presentation. I will ask the question, Cynthia, and then if you would like to uh, uh, comment, and then I'll, I'll turn the floor to Mahamud. This is the question then. The Cynthia, what type of of connections do you see between the dissident memorial and the wall practices from the 70s in Chile, in Chile uh, from groups such as Colectivo Acciones de Arte, how these actions have influenced the occupation of public spaces in Chile. And Mahmoud, I'm, I'm curious here to know I would like to know a little bit more about this, um, this art practices that have to be hidden. So you cannot add the, the word queer, for instance, that everything that has to be codified as in the book that you showed that somehow you have to hide it. So if you can comment a little bit more on that and other collective artists and also on this production context in Egypt, that would be interesting to know. Thank you. So we have 10 minutes to go before we end this meeting, okay? Cynthia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, I was here um, hearing and, and paying attention and trying to imagine how this unfinished wall process happened and, and what were the reasons. And I think it is mainly because it is an outdoor memorial. And I am sure that it is open and it 
allows us to continue integrating memories, updating them, adding reports. And I think that's also very relevant, very important in the memorial. And also uh, reorganizing images, working on the mediation process, not only with the community, but also with the artists and people that maintain the memorial currently. And as I said before, this is a place of dispute. And this process, unfinished process, when you think about the book and other ways of generating memory that Mahmoud was telling us, I was wondering, what is the next step? What do you, what is coming next? How will this space be a space for life, a living space? And in addition, I think there was this process of becoming, of unfolding that is really broad. And one of the organizations that took charge of this. They started to systematize this, uh, for example, uh, queer uh, printing uh, printers or, or printing shops so that we can uh, think about the power of these images in uh, Latin America and also their relationship with the neighboring communities. And that's for me a wonderful thing that is badly needed in this part of the world, this is really rare. And we have ways of making this uh, memory or memories collective and also expand these memories to the remainder of the region of Latin America. And we think about the limits of sex, there's another uh, art group or collective that is now opening an exhibition. And this year, for instance, they needed to show their work in uh, closed doors. And I always think about the consequences of what happened in the mural. The not only uh, of, uh, reducing uh, our possibilities, but also maybe establishing a safe place for us to keep thinking about our issues. And about your question, Daniela, I believe there's a tradition, indeed. The Ramona Parra Collective, for instance, the muralist collective in from the 70s, it's, this of course is part of this tradition of expressing by means of murals, some political positions and also uh, in-depth uh, thinking or uh, reflection processes and ideas that we want to uh, bring up and uh, show and manifest here in the future. And also a way of projecting ourselves into the future and one, uh, also discussing the images that we want to share uh, from now on. So it's about procedures, it's about trajectories and these collectives or art groups they were also censored, they were persecuted. And maybe uh, as they were present in public space. And this is the challenge of showing art in public spaces. So when you think about these uh, art groups and how they think about walls and public walls and uh, murals and how they also share uh, living experiences and what it means to censor these groups and how maybe you can think about other ways of projecting these images. That's it, thank you. Yes, uh, the question is about the, the codification, right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, something that I think inherited from <laughs> you know, being born and raised in Egypt and also got all my training in, in uh, 
most of my training in Egypt. So it's, uh, I think it's something inherited in something uh, embedded in the, um, you know, artists, they have it since a long time. And a very good example for that is Egyptian cinema, for example. If we think about the history of Egyptian cinema, I remember when I was a kid and there was a scene of a black and white film, and then you see a, a pot of coffee uh, pouring up, pouring down, like the fire is too um, high and the coffee is going out of the pot, you know that there's a sex scene at this time. So they use this kind of images to juxtapose what you think of it. So they, in order not to make a sex scene on screen in a film, they used to have this kind of, you know, a, a allegory. And I think this kind of uh, tradition or a static strategy is inherited, you know, from from this um, generation and all of us were trying to find um, different ways to speak about what we really want to say, but we can't say things in a direct way. So uh, in a way I can tell you that, honestly, you need to complicate things and conceptualize it and make it, make it more allegorical for a policeman not to understand it. You know, because if a policeman understands what you're doing, then it's the end of it. This will be canceled, will be taken, will be completely away. So you really have to work more, to be more clever than the policeman to make the work possible for discussion and for you know, um, um, intervention in uh, public space. Um, at the beginning, I was very frustrated when I started working. I was very frustrated by this and uh, I was always thinking about what I can do, what I can do and all this. But then to be honest, it's become, became part of my tools that I have to think about things three, four times more than what I have to think about things when I'm somewhere else. If I was born in San Francisco, I would have been a completely different artist. I would have been speaking a completely different artistic language. But I think this challenge of dealing with state violence and how to be smarter than them allowed me to invent certain different tools. And it's not only me, I think all the artists, filmmakers, writers, they do the same. Um, so the, I think it's producing more allegory than, than just, you know, political, straightforward political activism art. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talks and uh, for the Q&A session on behalf of the Mass Museum. And thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone who watched us, who joined us. And you can watch it later. The seminar will be recorded on our YouTube channel, like with the previous seminars. Mahmoud and Cynthia, it was a great pleasure to join this space, to be here with you today. And also, you're invited to tomorrow's seminar, everyone. It starts at 11 a.m. That's our third panel. And the fourth panel at 2.30 p.m. tomorrow. Everyone is invited to join us. Would anyone like to say something else? Otherwise, we can just close our panel. OK, great. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And we can see each other, we'll see each other tomorrow then, okay? I'm officially closing the session.